Hello and welcome to this talk on scientific image integrity. Please subscribe so I can continue to provide videos on scientific imaging and related subjects. When you see how valuable this talk is, please tell others. This talk today is about from mistakes to misrepresentation, again, on scientific imaging and scientific ethics also known as image integrity. Today we'll talk about how to improve your scientific view. What are you seeing on the monitor and is it a reflection of all the tones in your image? Who cares about image ethics and how to stay out of trouble with an easy to use list that I call RARA. RARA includes recording data about imaging steps, archiving original images, reporting what you've done, applying post-processing equally to all pixels in an image and to related images, and avoiding the wrong changes in pre- and post-imaging. So let's start by talking about improving your scientific view. In other words, how you see images on computer monitors. Your monitor is the sole means that you have to view your images. And so this should be at the top of the list for what you need to do in order to see images correctly. So your computer should be in a windowless and darkened room, or at least in a dark part of the room so that you don't get glare or reflections off the screen. And you should be able to make out the darkest and lightest tones in an image. So in order to do that, it's useful to see what the darkest and lightest tones are and whether you can or cannot see those. Here at a website, you can look at patches that are on a screen in order to determine if you can make out the differences between the darkest tones. Those tones are number one and two at the upper left of the screen. You can also look to see if you can see the differences between the lightest tones, in this instance, between 253 and 254 at the bottom right of your screen. The website is www.lagom.nl. When you go to this site, if you can't distinguish the darker squares and the lighter square patterns, then it would be imperative to calibrate your display with a calibration device such as one that's available from Data Color. If you don't have that device and you, you have access to settings on your monitor, you can use the settings in order to see the lightest and darkest squares and then keep your monitor at those settings. It's really, really important to see the visual data that's contained within the pixels that make up your image. I've been in a situation where a PI who ran a very large lab was looking at gels on her monitor. The monitor was not calibrated, and to her way of thinking, all of the gels were too dark and needed to be lightened, when in fact they were at the appropriate exposure. The key point to remember is that everything that you see on the screen is scientific data. Images are scientific data, often 50% of a paper. Often what people look at first when reading a paper, often looking at the figures before the paper is even read. So it's really important that you see exactly what is in the images. The other piece that has to do with monitors is the importance of the viewing angle. On a laptop, the electronics that are used are called twisted pneumatic electronics. These have a very narrow viewing angle. You can test this by moving your head in relation to the screen, and you can see that as you move your head up and down, the screen darkens. So all it takes is to be a little bit off angle, and you're not seeing the image appropriately. However, if you use an in-plane switching screen, these have a wide viewing angle, and this is the kind of screen you need to buy. So if two people are in a room evaluating an image and they're both looking at the screen at different viewing angles, it's very important that both people see the same image and not an image that, has, that darkens because you're off angle. So who cares about image ethics? Well, as it turns out, there's a lot of interest in image integrity for scientific images. If you just do a web search, you can see a number of articles and websites devoted 
to scientific imaging and image integrity. What you'll also find is there are people who are out in the scientific community who are dedicating their entire careers now to actually looking at research papers to determine whether or not image fraud or image falsification or image fabrication has occurred. This is Dr. Elizabeth Bick in uh, the year 2022. She found a paper in which she found image manipulation and you can see in this image here that these bands have been duplicated when they're supposed to be representing two different control proteins but are exact duplicates of each other. There's also the Office of Research Integrity that oversees scientific misconduct cases, an agency that is separate from NIH. And you can find on the web published standards and guidelines that do address the issues of what you should and shouldn't do in order to make an image, uh, a scientific image that is published in, in uh, scientific journals. So you can see a lot of people care about image ethics, including the National Science Foundation. Uh, as of 2010, all who submit for grants to NSF must agree to provide ethics training, training to all students, postdocs, and staff. The Office of Research Integrity uh, is interested. They've found that 44% uh, of cases involved accusations of image fraud compared with 6% a decade before that, and that's early 2000s. And then in the Journal of Clinical Investigation, they found 10 out of 10 to 20 out of 350 showed some evidence of image tampering. Journal of Cell Biology have identified 250 papers with questionable figures. Um, and they were rejected because the editors, note this, determined the alterations affected the data's interpretation. And finally, false images now form the top scientific misconduct cases as of 2016 and likely continues today uh, in this year, 2022. So how do you stay out of trouble? How do you comply with image ethics? And here I made a checklist called RARA. Note that this checklist is a result of a seminal article that was published in 2004 entitled What's in a Picture? The Temptation of Image Manipulation by Mike Rossner. This is a seminal paper that has produced the guidelines that you now see in many journals uh, for authors when it comes to image, when it comes to post-processing. If you look at the one paragraph of this article that is often looked at when speaking to uh, image integrity, you'll find that the Journal of Cell Biology includes this statement. Also, I should note that other information is included in other published standards, which include other parts of the list that we will go through in, in the guidelines that I put forth. So, here they are. Ra ra. Record what you've done. Archive originals. Report what you've done. Apply changes equally and globally. Avoid the wrong changes and apply only appropriate changes. Record what you've done. You need to record what you've done when you acquired the image, and you need to record what you've done in post-processing. What are the things that you need to record when you acquire an image? Depending on the camera and system you use, it varies. In this instance, with fluorescence, you want to know the exposure, the gain, the voltage, the aperture opening, the pixel resolution, the contrast, the bit depth, uh, whether or not you use column averaging, the Z step and so on and the equipment settings so that that would be the kinds of settings you would record if you were using a comp focal. To make it easier many manufacturers will give you metadata which is data about the data that you can find simply by opening the image and then uh, in image J you can go to show info it will show you all of the data you need to record for that particular image. Note that it may not be comprehensive and this may also be something that you would write in a notebook. So here's a lab notebook, not a very neat one, would be another way in which you would want to record entries. 
You can also record what you've done in post-processing if you're in Photoshop by using a function called history log. And you can incorporate that function into Photoshop uh, rather easily. So here in Photoshop, if I go to edit, I can go down to preferences and then go to history and content credentials. There you find history log and you can check that. Choose where you wish to save the history log, which will be a text file that's amended each time you go into Photoshop and then tell it that you would like those uh, log items to be detailed. The next time you go into Photoshop, everything will get recorded to that log file as text. If you're using image J, you can incorporate a way in which you can, you can record what's being done to an image. It's a little clunkier, but if you go into uh, image J, you can include a macro to record what's being done in an image while you're working on it. If you go into plugins, macros, and choose uh, record, you will get a recorder, and as you're working, it will record what's being done. Whether or not you choose to use history log in Photoshop, Photoshop will record what you're doing to the metadata. And you can find that metadata under File uh, and File Info. Uh, and then you can see in the Photoshop selection, you can see what sorts of things you've done to the image. And that's saved with the image as long as you save it as a TIFF or a Photoshop file. You may lose that metadata if you save the image as a JPEG. In the scientific world, you must, must archive your raw images, your original images. And there was a time when you'd put that on DVDs, but nowadays hard drives are so inexpensive and store such large volumes of information. It's best to then save all of your original images to two hard drives on a regular basis. The one on your computer and a backup. Also, it's important to create your directories in such a way that you put all of your raw images into their own file folder and then save your images as TIFFs for Photoshop corrections. Again, you make a TIFF file from the raw image and that's used for post-processing. Do not archive images in PowerPoint. PowerPoint will reduce the resolution of your image so that you can see here that the raw image has a fair amount of resolution and in the PowerPoint image you can see that the resolution has been thrown away and less pixels. Sooner or later a publication will ask for your original images if they see that there's any evidence of image manipulation or image beautification. Here's the most critical piece of rah-rah report what you've done. You report this in the methods or in the figure captions. You need imaging equipment details and you need post-processing steps. Note that anything can be done to an image as long as it's reported. Now in this part of the talk we're not going to address the kinds of images that are intended for measurement of densities or intensities. Instead, we'll be talking about representative images and images that are meant for measurement or visualization. The reason that scientists, to my way of thinking, the reason they don't report post-processing, it's because of one word, enhance. They don't want other labs to see that they've enhanced an image. Enhancement means that something was done to artificially make the image look more pleasing instead of being authentic and scientific. However, many post-processing steps are accepted in the scientific community. Here's a short list. Uneven illumination correction, noise reduction, filling the tonal range of the image bit depth, also called histogram stretching, colorizing, decolorizing, pseudo-coloring, white balancing, color bright field images, and bit depth changes. So let's talk first about filling tonal range of the image bit depth or histogram stretching. This is done 99% of the time to images. So what does that mean? When you fill the tonal range of the bit depth you're stretching the histogram so that it fits between 0 and in this instance 255 for this 8-bit image. 
so it's appropriately processed if you stretch the histogram. And you can see that there are little uh, gaps in the histogram. That's because of rounding errors. Expanding the tonal range is not just accepted, but it's important because it increases tonal resolution. It should not be considered enhancement if enhancement means the image was artificially beautified. Expanding tonal range is called normalize in image J and it's best used for fluorescent images. Uh, you can see here that uh, I have an image that's open and uh, if you go under process to a mislabeled function called enhance contrast because when you enhance contrast you're given two choices one of the two choices does enhance the contrast that's the equalize choice but we're going to choose normalize and then because we don't want many pixels at all to be oversaturated we'll put in 0 0.01 so we'll simply click OK and that will allow the image to be, become brighter if in fact too dim. In this instance it isn't too dim therefore we didn't the normalize function didn't really do anything. So if you expand tones you can report that as follows. Tones were expanded to fill bit depth range for improved tonal resolution or you can say tones were normalized for improved tonal resolution. And why not report that? However, however, most labs over-process their images. This image is over-processed, also called oversaturated, And it's both oversaturated in the white range and oversaturated in the black range. So in this range, you would call it undersaturated. This is a great indication that the lab is not competent at image processing or at acquiring images. And this this is enhancement. When you want something to look so bright that viewers are forced to look at it or you are pushing your experimental evidence in their face, that's enhancement. It's also seen in the world of gels when white backgrounds are made pure white and in the world of color bright field and EM when the background is made so bright that you can't see any details. What are you hiding? Are you trying to obscure some information? That's the first thing a reviewer should think or a publication. So if you don't understand the term bit depth, uh, here's a short explanation. In a camera you have an A to D converter, an analog to digital converter that takes the electrical signals that are created when photons hit detectors and turns them into numbers that are then assigned to the pixels in your image. One binary unit is off or on just like a light switch so it's called a binary image. It's either black or it's white. If you can stack those binary units and then, then they are to a binary unit to some exponent and they would comprise gray values between black and white. So 2 to the 8th would be 256 gray values or what's called an 8-bit bit depth. 256 includes 0, so in an image it's 0 to 255. 2 to the 12th would be 4,096 gray values. 2 to the 16th would be 65,536 gray values. So you can see that bit depths are assigned to describe how many tonal levels an image has from black to white. If you don't understand a histogram, the x-axes are the tones and they go from 0 to 255 when it's an 8-bit image or 0 to 65,535 for a 16-bit image. The y-axis would be the number of pixels at any one of these positions. Note that the top is cut off so you can see that the histogram is auto-scaled in the y-axis. So a pure white in this instance would be 255 for 8-bit or 65,535 for 16-bit and in both instances pure black is 0. Pure whites and blacks again contain no detail and are therefore saturated. So you have to wonder why labs show off their imaging incompetence by saturating pixels. And there's probably there's three reasons, maybe more. Maybe they haven't been educated, maybe displays are not set correctly, or is it that 
fluorescent images are often in color and so as a result it's harder to see when you saturated in uh, these two different colors here, red and blue, it's hard to see that you've saturated the pixels. Therefore, it's really important to always look at your images, especially from a confocal, in grayscale so that you can better see whether pixels are under or oversaturated. Note also that the, that the blacks here are, are perfectly black and so you've lost all detail in the black. And here are a couple of caveats regarding tones. Again, we're talking about representative images. We're not talking about images that are meant for measurement. So images of gels, images in which you want to get fluorescence intensities, they do not have their tones expanded to fill the bit depth. Do not expand tones. Don't histogram stretch. However, there are times with fluorescence you have sub-resolution and featureless objects such as puncta and bacteria and obviously artifacts, those may be oversaturated for improved viewing, but do report. So you can see that we've already talked about the corrections that you would do by filling the tonal range of the image bit depth, but there are other corrections. Uneven illumination is a correction that one would do, noise reduction and white balancing so that you can remove uh, a color cast from your color bright field images. It's also things that you would do for publication. For an example, you may have to decolorize an image uh, for a plate or a figure. You may have to colorize an image. You may have to pseudocolor an image. You will have to make bit depth changes because all of those images have to be 8-bit. So that begs the question, what is the problem with reporting a correction? What's the problem with reporting a necessary change to the image? Please report and also give a rationale. And if you're not quite sure what I mean by pseudocolor, in this instance, I'm referring specifically to the kind of pseudocoloring that would show subtle differences in tone, uh, such as what was done with this gradient to show that there are individual pixel uh, values that comprise this gradient. 